Why are white girls always baby bluebirds breaking free a new spring? And when do I, a person of color, of earth, get that kind of recognition of wholeness? Somehow skin bleach is not solving my problems. Where do I find my beauty? In closets, in cosmetic creams, in you? My transness displays itself in many ways, whether it be being in silence or bold bravery in bleeding streets, a march that lasts a lifetime. For me, it is patience, a soft, imposing implosion. These battles driving my life expectancy into the ground, you're expecting me to live happily when telling me to sit quietly. These are standards that have no place in a home. I have no room left in my heart for patience. Why must silence be our siren? This is not what the real world smells like. With molasses slapped against my skin, brown seeping into brown, the hairs on my body caramelized as vanilla scents cloud my senses. Her smile is sickly sweet, saccharine. It is beautiful and body-breakingly wary. When did kin become assigned to sin, like when we walk alone at night and view through damned eyes our own skin and we run, eyes closed, fists clenched. When was kin made synonymous to sin, to begin again would be to strip body of false ideas of what worth means. A self-hate so underlying they wouldn't know it if it was their own reflection, or is it their own reflection that's retching at the sight it sees? When did subjecting self to torture become synonymous to survival? When will I let go of this noose? See, it's a cycle that goes on and on and on for me. Unity be a search for solidarity, where black babies are seen as bringers of purity, where purity is dismantled as savior, and where white savior is revealed to be hollowness. These are rules on which to found a living. I really wish I did not have to talk after that. <laughs> that was incredible. And a huge thank you to Andrea for the lovely introduction. And can we get one more round of applause for Leo? Leo came from Youth Speaks. Check them out. They are at youthspeaks.org. We are lucky to get to partner with them on lots of programs. They just had an amazing curiosity event. So big shout out to them and definitely check them out. And without any further ado, I'm now going to bring up the four people that all of you are here to see. So it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's panel, Alicia Garza, co-founder of Black Lives Matter, which not coincidentally is the community grand marshal for this year's San Francisco Pride. Darnell Moore, senior correspondent at Mike. And keep in mind, everybody has about a million things after this first line, so we'll let them get into all of their other biography here. So Darnell Moore, senior correspondent at Mike. Aria Saeed, programs director at St. James Infirmary. And last but certainly not least, mar moderator Barbara Smith, black feminist author and activist and co-founder of the Kambahi River Collective. Again, many other things, but let's get them up on stage. Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm Barbara Smith, and I'm so pleased to be in conversation with Alicia Garza, co-founder of Black Lives Matter, Darnell Moore, senior correspondent for Mike, and Arya Saeed, program manager for St. James Infirmary. Let's get started. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to start with the question that I find most historically intriguing, which is why is there such a visible connection between Black Lives Matter and the LGBTQI community? We did not necessarily see that kind of connection during other periods of the black liberation struggle. Mm. So, 
Take it away. <laughs> what y'all think? <laughs> you first. Hey, everybody. Hey. Um, well, I think the first thing that feels pretty obvious, um, but if it's not obvious, we should just say it, is that the way that this upsurge has been able to emerge with visible, unapologetic leadership from queer folks is because of the work that people like you yes. and people like Linda Burnham here in this room have done to pave the way. We would not, absolutely not be here if it was not for the work that you all have done. So give it up. Thank you. And then of course, in addition to that, I think that part of how we emerge is also from our experiences trying to be a part of social justice work. And even though so much work has been done to lay the foundation for us to be here, um, it's still incredibly difficult. And we're still having conversations that we would have hoped had kind of been put to bed a while ago. Um, these conversations about whether or not, right, black folks are also queer. <laughs> I would have hoped that we would have been done with that conversation, um, right? right? But even in the question, right, we get a lot of uh, inquiries about what does the gay agenda have to do with Black Lives Matter? And what we say is there is no agenda. We're trying to get free, right? And so that's what we're trying to move here. And it is not a coincidence uh, that this, uh, iteration of um, of the Black Freedom Movement is led by queer folks. It's not a coincidence, um, but that doesn't mean that it's any less challenging, and it doesn't mean that there aren't that there are less conversations and interventions that need to be had, uh, even within the movement, right? Not just externally, but certainly inside. We still have a lot of work to do. Anyone else? <laughs> I don't know, I, I, I wanted just to, to add on, first of all, it's just an honor always to, to be in conversation with you. So mm -hmm. many of us who identify as queer, black activists, organizers, mm -hmm. um, we name your work and the work of so many black lesbian feminists mm -hmm. as the grounds upon which our politics were shaped. I so thank you. She was looking at us like, I'm so glad. I'm like, what? You're right. glad to be? <laughs> you know who you, you are? Exactly. Um, <laughs> but like um, our Sister Alicia said, I, I am. I, I, so the, the idea is that queer and trans and gender nonconforming black folk have always been involved uh, sure. in the, black, the long black f freedom struggle. Um, to the extent that we have allowed those names and those lives to sort of be uh, to, to, to be out, you know, to be celebrated is one story. Oh, but, cool. um, you know, I think, for instance, of Cheryl Clark's essay in the 1980s, um, The Failure to Transform Homophobia in the Black Community, where she called people like Amiri Baraka to the carpet, not only for their, their failure to address queer antagonism, mm -hmm but their patriarchy and the sexism mm, that was much, that was very much um, how they understood the, uh, black liberation to sort of go. I think about your, the, the work of Kambahi. I think about um, June Jordan and Audre Lorde. I think about folk like Essex Hemphill um, and Joseph Beam in Philadelphia. These folk were black and queer and trans. I think about Pauli Murray who said, it isn't just Jim Crow, it's Jane Crow. Mm. So far before we had the languages afforded to us by people like Kimberly through intersectionality or mm -hmm. the simultaneity of oppression, which we find in a Kambahi statement, our people mm -hmm. always been here. Mm -hmm. And not just, not just in the 70s and the 60s, we were on the plantations. We were the Nat Turners on plantations mm -hmm. too, the Harriet Tubmans on plantations mm -hmm. too. Queer people always been here. That's right. Always been here, jumping off ships to get free. Yes. So That's I don't it. want to imagine ourselves out of this long struggle for black liberation. Black, queer, and trans folk, gender non-conforming folk mm -hmm. have 
always been a part of this struggle. Mm. I think now that we have the tools to actually, we can, the, the tools have been democratized. Mm. We don't have to wait for straight cisgender folk to talk for us. Mm. We will go on Twitter, we will go on Instagram, we will go and create our own avenues to say that we've been here. <laughs> Thank, Thank you, Darnell. How are you? I think now we're just seeing a space where we can bring the fullness of ourselves in the narrative as opposed to before where we had to be politically correct. Mm. And now we get to shed that and we get to <laughs> be all of ourselves in, in who we are mm -hmm. and like liberation on so many levels mm -hmm. that intertwine as opposed to just this linear way of thinking about race. Cause we're talking about mm. race now, we're talking about gender, mm -hmm. we're talking about socioeconomic status and we're talking about privilege, like things that people weren't talking about before in the same way. I still find it interesting having lived through all those movements or at least most of them that we're talking about. I wasn't around for the slave rebellions. But, <laughs> <laughs> but, but had I been alive at the time, I would have been, been involved. I would have been involved, yes. <laughs> but be that as it may, I find it really intriguing that even in a place like Albany, New York, where I live, mm -hmm. which is like a neighborhood and a city, uh, as far as its population, uh, Albany is the capital of the capital of the world, mm -hmm. says the mayor, <laughs> <laughs> our first woman mayor who I work with, Kathy Sheehan. That's what, how she describes our city, and I believe that. But it's still less than 100,000 people. Mm -hmm. And yet, our Black Lives Matter uh, organization, and we also have another organization called Capital Area Against Mass Incarceration, mm -hmm. yes. which began a bit before BLM. Mm -hmm. It has a leadership of queer women of color. Mm -hmm. And I just find that fascinating because as I said, it's not like a metropolis. It's not New York City. It's not San Francisco or Los Angeles or Chicago. And yet that uh, movement, that uh, kind of trajectory of our politics, our leadership being central to uh, the revolutionary uh, interventions of our time. I mm -hmm. just find it really interesting. And of course, we can't write history as it's happening. But in years to come, people are go going to look at that and say, oh, okay, so because of the, yeah. you know, the uh, uh, pass of the 60s to the 70s to the 80s in the 20th century, now we're actually at a place where we can be visible mm -hmm. as a political leaders that mm -hmm. we are. I think it's wonderful and exciting. Mm. So, uh, from the vantage point of your different spheres of work, Alicia as an activist and organizer, Aria as a community service provider, and Darnell as a journalist and scholar, how do you see the connections between Black Lives Matter and the LGBTQI movements? And, any, and one thing, you know, I don't know if I conveyed this, we don't all have to go down a road <laughs> one right after the other. Because I was going to certainly Anybody look jump like, in. Anybody jump in. In fact, <laughs> I would encourage that the last, per, you know, that we do it in a different order. I'll sure. keep them awake and, you know. <laughs> Anyone who wants to respond, like, how does LGBTQI community identity connect to Black Lives Matter and the work that you do sure. each day? I think... For me, being on the outside and looking in at Black Lives Matter and the work that you all are doing, um, we're seeing so many different communities being elevated to a spotlight and notice, and their humanity is sort of given back to them because of this movement. And so like I was saying earlier about the fullness of ourselves, I think Black Lives Matter has sort of promoted, A, number one, that our lives do matter. Our lives have value. And I think because we don't see ourselves in other people, um, we don't value other people as much as we value ourselves and who we know. And Black Lives Matter is giving voices to other people who are also black, but also transgender and also gay and also queer identified and also do sex work or also are homeless or impoverished. And like those voices are being heard more now than they were before. And so that's Either one. I saw it, Darnell. Go for it. <laughs> we do this all the time. Yeah. Um, I guess I'll speak a, a bit about what I, what I think is how Black Lives Matter has functioned as an intervention within media and, and maybe within academic spaces, too. But the one thing I know is that as someone who works in media, um, for whom, in, in spaces where um, 
corporate media sectors are not always ready to talk about the type of stories that matter to black and brown people in a way that they need to be talked about. Yes. What, what Black Lives Matter has done, it's both, it, Black Lives Matter isn't the bad thing, but it's, this take, it has a, do, a double effect. Mm -hmm. on, on the one hand, it's, mean, it's meant that those news outlets that have not talked about Black Lives Matter either as a phenom, like as a hashtag thing, you're behind. Mm. And, and now, like, folk are rushing to get a black story. Mm. Um, and, and the good ones are rushing to get black people to tell the stories. <laughs> um, <laughs> on the other hand, on the other hand, though, the, the, danger, the danger of a moment like this is that it's easy to commodify oh, sure. Black Lives Matter as a hashtag. That is to say, oh, See, we wrote the Black Lives Matter story, but that doesn't, that doesn't mean you care about the black lives attached to that story. Come on. Um, so it's really, it's, uh, for me, it's a, it's a double-edged sword um, because I've, I've been part of these sort of pitches and, and these, these conversations with, with writers across the country who are being called upon to write about Black Lives Matter in companies, let's say, that doesn't even have more than five black people working in the office. Mm -hmm. So it's a disconnect, yeah? Um, that you can gain traction because you're talking about this hashtag while not addressing, and, and it's the same thing that's happening in universities. Universities want to throw and have all types of Black Lives Matter conferences. And my, my response has been, if you cannot address the extent to which your policies are structurally racist, mm. are, are, you don't, where's your faculty of color? Mm. Where, where are your policies that, that, are, that are not a, turning your schools into, into mock, into mini jail cells so that people are getting policed on campuses where they should otherwise be going to the library? Like, if you're not addressing those policies, then you don't need to have a Black Lives Matter event. Come on. Don't host the event. Fix yourself so that you can demonstrate <laughs> that Black Lives actually matter. <laughs> If you were holding the mic, Darnell, I would ask you to drop it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Do you hear me? <laughs> so I don't know if I can follow up on that, but um, to me, the connection is both obvious and it's also underneath the surface. And what I mean by that is um, there really isn't a a, as much of a separation between Black Lives Matter and issues impacting LGBTQIA mm -hmm. communities, yeah? Um, but most of where that separation comes from, I think, is the ways in which narratives are told about who we are as black folks, right? right? There is somehow a prototype of who black people are and then everybody else is like an outlier, mm. yeah? So, when Black Lives Matter gets described, oftentimes people say, oh, it's a movement against police brutality. That's part of it. Mm. That's not all of it. And I don't know how many times we can say that. We've been saying that, I mean, since the very beginning. We've been saying that Black Lives Matter is very much a movement about the sanctity of black life. Yeah. It is a movement to restore dignity mm -hmm. to black life which means that all of the issues mm -hmm. <laughs> impacting black people in all of our forms and contours is what's at the center of this movement, period. So it's not just about policing, mm -hmm. although policing impacts queer communities differently than it impacts other communities, but when you're black and queer, it's a whole other thing, Right. okay? Um, this is a movement about economic justice. Mm -hmm. This is a movement about racial and gender justice. This is a movement to reimagine mm. what our lives can and should look like. Not just black lives. Y'all heard me? Somebody right. take notes. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody, tweet gonna, somebody tweeting me right now, like, she's a racist. <laughs> <laughs> she only talking about black people. No. We know, you know what I'm saying? Yes. It's about all of us, but when we look at the quality of life of black folks, right. when we look at the issues that black folks are facing, then when we take that and layer it, and we say, well, what are the issues that black queer folks are facing? What are the issues that black trans folks are facing, right? Then we start to dive into the nuances and complexities of our specific experiences, and we start to use that to vision a better world. We don't use 
black or any cis people as the control mm -hmm. for what a better world can look like. Right. Okay. Right. We have to start with the folks who are being impacted in multiple ways mm -hmm. by interlocking systems right. that privilege some folks right. at the expense of others. Yes. Right? That's where we start from. Yeah. Uh, I do have to say, too, that there's a lot of work that we have to do. We have been intentional about putting out a call to say black folks of all stripes, but in particular, black folks who even get marginalized within black movements, mm -hmm. this is yours. Mm -hmm. This is ours. Yep. Help us shape this. Yeah? But even within that, we have our own tensions and dynamics that we're grappling with. Yeah? We get called a lot to the table around, well, what are you actually doing for black trans folks? Mm -hmm. And we said, well, we're not doing anything for black trans folks. We want to create a space where black trans folks can lead. Yeah? People say, well, why can't you do more about this or more about that? Well, it requires the active engagement and participation of everyone in our communities, even with the pain and trauma that we feel at having been excluded from other movements that we should be a part of, we should be mindful to try and transform that dynamic within ourselves, right? Uh, the last thing I'll just offer is, you know, one thing that I, I struggle with uh, is that I, I, I'm concerned about something that Darnell said, which is how BLM has become a brand. Mm. It has become, sexy to somehow be aligned or in alignment with what you might think is a part of this movement. And I really want to just echo what you said earlier about this isn't a brand to get close to. This isn't a label that you get to wear. This is about transforming the conditions in our communities, which in a lot of cases means transforming how you're acting in this community. Yeah. yeah? We don't want to be a tack on right, mm. <laughs> for more publicity <laughs> or more conversation. And we get that a lot. People say, well, let's have Black Lives Matter at the table. Then it's going to be interesting because y'all think we're about to turn up or something. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> well, that but happens too. It does happen. It does happen, but not on command. <laughs> right. But not on command. <laughs> right? We're not performers. That's right. This is our lives. Yeah. Right. So when... Trans women are murdered in the Bayview. This is not a performance. That's right. Right? When 13 trans women have been killed this year that we know of, that's not a performance. Right? When there are 50 people who are murdered inside of a gay club right. in Orlando, and not just people, but black and brown folks, mm -hmm. this is not a performance. This is not some, a sticker to add. This is not um, something that you get close to for status or recognition. These are people's lives. These are our lives. And so if we're going to transform in the ways in which we're talking about, it requires the active participation of everyone, not just black folks, right? But some real deep learning and thinking about, well, yeah, how, how is my institution doing around valuing black lives? And don't tell me, oh, I have a black person on the board. Or, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> right. I know a black person. <laughs> <laughs> My neighbor's black. We <laughs> stand on the <laughs> No. What are we doing to transform our institutions? And how are we ourselves being transformed? Uh, I think you're talking about. Yeah. Sure. I think that you're talking about uh, a great model of genuine grassroots activism, mm. uh, where people have agency and get to define their own agenda. Uh, as Fannie Lou Hamer said, mm. uh, when she was uh, being assaulted by and attacked by uh, whomever, the criminal justice representatives uh, uh, in um, Mississippi, she said, I didn't go to register for you or somebody else. I came to register for myself. So, you know, that's what we're trying to do. As you said, we're not providing for, we're providing that space to uh, mm. define our own activism and agenda. Uh, the massacre in Orlando has already been mentioned. 
Uh, it happened a week ago, and it has brought a rare degree of attention to the mere existence of LGBTQIA learning, mm. people of color, at the same time that various political agendas have distorted or obscured what occurred. I'd like to hear your thoughts about the impact of this atrocity and also how it has affected you personally. Anyone can jump in with that. And we can take a little breath too because this is an incredibly somber subject. Yeah, I, um, the last week was uh, particularly hard. Um, and, uh, you know, so a few, a few thoughts um, come to mind. I was, I'm, I'm really interested in how um, the, these, the material bullets that one can shoot out of a gun in the same way that one can use their hands is preceded by ideological bullets. And um, so mm -hmm. I was mourning, but I was also very aware that most people could look at this lone gunman as a spectacular terrorist mm -hmm. bad person That's right. and not see how their silences or their complicity in, in a range of antagonistic actions on a daily Usher. makes a shooter like that possible. Usher. So I had no patience for folk who have been silent when states are passing horrible ass tran uh, tr these transgender bathroom laws. Um, I had no patience for folk who, who cried, they should, right? In a moment like this who have been silent and have not spoken up at any other time when LGBTQIA people have been assaulted, demonized, casted out in their churches, in legislative halls, mm -hmm. and now there are tears. And I had to really, you know, deal with that, <laughs> that anger because my, my, my point was silence is violence, too. Mm. And, and it's one thing, you know. <laughs> it's one thing to, to, to rightly castigate the killer. Um, but, for, uh, but I held accountable all of my friends. That's right. Who identify as straight, who are cisgender, and ask them to see their own, see their, their own actions or inactions as complicities, as being complicit in, in holding someone like that up. Personally, for me, like this, you know, this is this is why it's important to understand to, to look look at that action through an intersectional lens. Black and brown, queer and trans, and gender nonconforming people are prone to the most violences of all of those on the spectrum. Um, so when this study came out this week that says, you know, LGBTQI people are, are the, the group most likely to be harmed and anybody, you no know, experience discrimination more than anyone else, that type of uh, um, talk is really dangerous mm. because it's not really asking the right type of questions. Well, which LGBT, and this is a question for us in mm -hmm. this room. So this is not an opportunity for, I'm, I'm gonna go here, y'all. Come on. For white, <laughs> just, listen to me, you I'm not, please. This is not on. an opportunity for, we all can be harmed because of our perceived queerness, mm. right? But I want you to understand that it isn't white, cisgender, queer men, and it isn't even me, a black, cisgender, queer man, who's most likely to be attacked when walking from the subway station in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. It's our trans sisters, it's mm -hmm. women. You hear what I'm trying to really get us to understand which queer and trans people are at most, uh, can most likely be harmed. And that's the folk we should be attending to. Oh, sure. Now we all can, and I hope y'all hear what I'm saying. Come on. Because it got real quiet. This is so dead. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I wanted to say too, yes. you know, this is not like a, a, a competition between oppressions. Listen. Mm. Yeah. This is not an opportunity for queer, this is, for the LGBTI community to say, well, look, I know that racism shit happens. Mm. I know it's, racial oppression and racial violence happens, but look, we're the group that most likely get it. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. Because when you look at it, really, the fact that our trans sisters will die without none of us marching. Mm. None of our pr proud feet marching or our wheelchairs moving. Mm. When our trans sisters, black sisters are killed, that tells you who really needs the attention. Mm. And who isn't given it? Ashay. 
either one. Whoever. I think for me, like sitting here and being a black trans woman and hearing this is like amazing because Orlando for me, of course the media has this imagery that they present to the world of who committed what. And all I had to do was keep telling myself to think of the 50 people. What if 50 people that I knew mm. were murdered? Like the 50 laughs and the kikis and the hangouts and their dreams, the 50 people that had like connections and family or family that they were seeking to, to heal relationships with or friendships that they had yet to reconcile. Like, those, those, the 50 hearts, like that's what I keep thinking about. And I think as a, as a black trans woman, like death for me is like, mm -hmm. I hear about it all the time in this way that I'm so desensitized to it that I have to bring my humanity back. Um, I hear about trans women being murdered all the time. And it's always this context of like, well, the man didn't know or, <laughs> or um, she was walking down the street and she was being catcalled and his masculinity was so fragile that it was threatened that he needed to go chase her, that he needed to curb stomp her in an alley. Or like, and I'm so used to hearing these stories that it's, it's literally like hearing my alarm clock. Mm. And I'm being in, like so serious right now, like me and my girlfriends, like when we talk, we're always talking about when we die. Can you control this narrative or this memory of me? Can you, you know, tell them like who I really was and not an unidentified African American male who dressed as a woman? Like mm. that mm. sort of media portrayal or using you know, my birth name and like making me out to be this like caricature, because it still happens. And um, without using that narrative of that I deceive some man, when I met him on an online platform and told him, and he was perfectly fine with it, but he sought to, to kill me. Like, that's, that's a real reality that most trans, black trans women face every single day. Every time that I leave the bar, I think, I look, half look over, like, is today gonna be my day? And um, so Orlando for me had to make me remember my humanity and to remember those people, those lives. The same thing with the trans women that continually are murdered and no one says anything. I have to remember about who they were. What were they like at a, you know, at a night with drinking and you know, foolishness of being young and roaming the streets and, like, I had to think about those things because the numbers sort of make you so used to death. Then you're like, okay, 50 people died. Like, that's like sociopathic in a way. But when you're part of a community and you're so used to hearing about death in this way, you just get used to it as like a pending reality. tell them who I really was. Yeah. Um, two of my coworkers uh, had people who were shot or who were killed. And uh, the thing that I've been really fascinated by um, with this entire thing is the way that um, I worry that we're not really telling folks who folk really were. Mm. Um, so, you know, now there's campaigns, pray for Orlando, I am Orlando, we are Orlando, mm. um, but we should be really clear. Mm -hmm. uh, we should be really clear about how, what's the climate in Orlando for queer people. Yes. Um, why, right, was this club in particular 
populated largely <coughs> by black and brown folks. Right. I watched uh, on CNN uh, Anderson Cooper do what I thought was actually really brilliant coverage mm -hmm. uh, and to interview uh, the state's attorney. Mm. Did he not take her to task though? <laughs> <laughs> He was like, you're, pray what are you you're praying for Orlando? Because I'm pretty sure you right. were in charge of litigating on behalf of the state right. against mm. marriage equality. Right. I'm pretty sure. And then I'm pretty sure that when the court said you're tripping, that you pursued it all the way up to exactly. the US Supreme Court. I'm pretty sure. Right. So what's this thing on your website? And she said, it's many hands of different colors holding each other. You know what Wait, I'm saying? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, what I feel about Orlando mm -hmm. is that this is, um, unfortunately, uh, the state of our world. Yeah. Uh, and I fear very deeply um, that we will see more of these types of shootings. There will be more mass shootings. Um, there have been too many in the past few years. Uh, and I feel curious about um, some of the unique responses that have happened after Orlando in particular. Uh, I feel really curious about uh, how we can be clear-eyed but also clear-tongued yeah. about how we're responding or not responding. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I've seen a lot of corporations take this up, too. We are Orlando, and I think that's dope. Except when the ways in which those corporations operate mm. in poor black and brown communities create the conditions where people don't have safe space. Talk. They don't have space. Talk. You know what I'm saying? So if you're a company that is helping to further the crisis of foreclosures. You ain't Orlando. Right. Or, or not paying minimum wage. Or not paying, or not a, paying a minimum wage. wage that people can live on. Or not allowing that. workers to unionize. Yeah. Yeah. You are not Orlando. Yeah. And I think we have to be really clear about this. And this is my call for us. Yes. Um, so as a queer person, um, I know that what I saw with marriage equality is that being queer became a brand. Yep. Just like BLM is becoming a brand, right? And suddenly it becomes enough to put a rainbow flag up and say, we down. Right. We can't allow that to continue right. to happen, right? I mean, being in, the, in a home of such incredible activism led by queer folks and trans folks, we cannot allow corporations to benefit off of our misery. Mm. We cannot allow corporations to say, I am, when all of these other things are happening yes. that are creating the conditions that our communities are living in. If you look at who these folks were, yes. if you look at what kinds of work they were doing, they weren't corporate execs. Mm. They didn't work for Facebook. They didn't, y'all. Right. This is a tough conversation. We have to have it. We have to have it. Uh, the other thing that just feels important for me to say is um, I never got so many calls from straight people Same here. as I did after <laughs> this mass murder in yeah. Orlando. Same thing. And on the one hand, I was like, thanks for looking out. Where were you all the other days? But where you been? <laughs> where you been? Like, like this conversation is, is, is not going to absolve you, right? But this is a good start. This is a good start. Uh, but I guess my point in there, right, is, um, again, like, there's a way in which I want to push us all to think about what our lives would be like if we tried to live the world that we want to see every day. Mm -hmm. For many of us, it would be uncomfortable. 
it would be uncomfortable. We spend a lot of time, right, trying to survive, <laughs> trying to fit in, right? But we also spend a lot of time not talking about the ways in which we're complicit in our own oppression. And this is not a, you know, a blaming thing, because I know people do this with black folks all the time. Well, if we would just whoop de whoop, I'm so tired of those conversations, <laughs> so please trust me, that's not what's happening here. But given that some of us have been able to be mobile, mm. given that for some of us that branding gives us access that we didn't have before, yeah. then what are we doing now that we have that access? Are we just comfortable? I'm like, cool, I work at Facebook, it's all good. We've reached equality? No, no. So for me with Orlando, those are the questions that are coming mm -hmm. up for me. How our tragedies become commodities? Yeah. Uh, I also had a very unique experience where, um, <laughs> bless them, uh, <laughs> bless them. Some, someone engaged me and said, well, where is BLM on this issue? Why have you not spoken up? You're not being a very good ally. And I just had to sit with this, like, I'm not an ally. <laughs> like, gay as hell. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> and not only that, but for those of us who <laughs> have committed our lives to this work, yeah. um, I'm also not a robot. So what if I don't have words after a tragedy happens? Yeah. Another tragedy. What if I don't have words? What if I'm just trying to get a little bit of joy because I see death and destruction and slaughter all the time? What if there are no words sometimes? Mm. What does it mean that, um, that you're expecting me, you're expecting us, BLM, to have the conversations that you're not ready to have. It's not my job to find language for you to have that conversation. Mm, talk. You know? So there's something in there that we've just got to deal with, which is also like, uh, what do we call it? We call it disaster tourism or disaster chasing. You know, who's going to be the first to say how sorry they are about a tragedy? How about we just stop them from happening? Right. How about what, we stop them? And from what would that them? take? <laughs> that's, that's a rhetorical question. That's a rhetorical, a rhetorical question. question. There's a lot that's all, all wrapped up in this. And having, you know, raised the complexities of how we stop it from happening at all. I believe that the day that Orlando happened, there had already been 134 mass shootings right. in the United States. A mass shooting is defined as a shooting in which four <coughs> or more people That's are right. shot, either mm. injured or killed. That's 134. Right. That's absurd, okay. it's really absurd. So your reactions to Orlando illustrate how important it is to use an intersectional approach. Everyone who responded was talking about looking at things through more than one narrow lens. The term intersectionality is frequently used nowadays, but I'd like to talk for a minute about its origins and also to hear your perspectives about what intersex intersectionality means and why it's important in your work. So, intersectionality is rooted in the organizing of black and other feminists of color in the 1970s. Come on. Many of us were also <laughs> lesbians. And the Combahee River Collective Statement, which was written in 1977, we wrote about interlocking oppressions and the simultaneity of oppression, which Brother Darnell has already cited. Uh, legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw coined the term intersectionality in law journal articles in the late 1980s. But as I said, in the 1970s, we were practicing intersectionality via our politics, okay. not just through what we were writing. Okay. Uh, the term identity politics is also almost always misused. Uh, example, an example would be ignoring police brutality against trans women, black trans women, and cisgendered black women, including black lesbians, and looking only at the cases that uh, reinforce a familiar narrative of black men being endangered. Mm -hmm. So um, I just wanted to give you a little, you know, <laughs> a little lesson, yes. a little game, put us up with some game. And I also want to let you know that soon, 
Oh, in five minutes, we'll be taking your questions for our panelists. If you have a question, please line up in the far aisle to your, to your right, all the way against the wall. <laughs> Over there, my left. Uh, please remember to ask single, one-part questions that are actually <laughs> questions. <laughs> so, so we could talk about intersectionality, but because we only have a few minutes left and we've kind of illustrated it without you know, necessarily defining it again, I want to move to what I think is critical Come on. here uh, as we conclude this part of our uh, evening. As someone from the East Coast, I know that we tend to idealize the Bay Area as being totally progressive. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to hear what's going on in San Francisco around racism within the queer community, with the police, or in any context you wish to address it. Honey. I'm from New York. I'm from New York, so I don't have to answer. Brooklyn in the house. <laughs> I'm gonna sip my tea, my water. It was, okay. it was racism. Jump in. It was racism. What was? Sorry, I didn't catch all racism the Racism in the queer LGBTQIA community with the police or in any context you wish to address it. What's going on here? Right okay. here. Um, in the Bay Area, black trans women don't have anything. I could stop there, but mm -hmm. we don't have housing. We are incarcerated like no other group that I can think of right now um, for survival tactics that any other group would do, and it's just sort of a pat on the wrist. Um, we don't have equal access to employment in the Bay Area. Um, and if we do, we're not normally afforded leadership opportunities in the jobs that we're in, um, no matter how much we climb, um, because we're sort of seen as a, as a benefit in some industries. Um, that's like a huge thing. Uh, when we do sex work, um, a lot of us are engaging in survival sex work. There's a difference between doing survival sex work and being sort of a voluntary escort. And some of us have been able to do all different types of sex work and not even be able to call it that. Mm -hmm. But a lot of black trans women are doing survival sex work where they are literally performing sex work to survive, to get a hotel for the night, to get high for the night just to make it a little bit easier, like all these different aspects of us. So in the Bay Area, that's what we experience. Um, of course, we get harassed by law enforcement regularly. Um, and that's the place that I can sort of speak from right. as, as black trans women. Lack of economic opportunity and exactly. options and also uh, undue attention from and uh, negative contact with uh, law enforcement. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> you know, I miss San Francisco. Uh, I had a hard time getting here <laughs> this afternoon. I'm born and raised in the Bay Area. My family's four generations deep in San Francisco. But gentrification is so bad, I can't find my way around a place that I grew up in. I used to walk these streets as a teenager, unbeknownst to my family. <laughs> uh, but I don't recognize it. And I have to be honest that uh, gentrification is a huge issue here in San Francisco. It is changing the political dynamics in this city. It is changing how we even understand what is progressive or not. Mm. People are getting elected as progressives that are nowhere near okay. progressive. Yeah. That's a real thing. <laughs> We've had and continue to have scandals in the San Francisco Police Department that are not being addressed, period. They're not being addressed. Were it not for the activism of the Frisco 500, were it not for the Frisco Five who did a hunger strike, were it not for Doctors for Black Lives and all of these folks who are saying, we're not allowing this to just go undiscussed, 
then we wouldn't even be having this conversation. We would not be having this conversation. We're seeing uh, a real transformation of the city that uh, is historical and not in a good way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have to be really, really honest. Uh, for me, San Francisco has become a shadow of what it once was. I know so many people who have told me the stories of their migration to San Francisco, mm -hmm. that they migrated here because where they were coming from was an intolerant, unsafe, violent place. And yet San Francisco is beginning to remake itself in that image. Mm. I'm terrified about the future of San Francisco. There was a black woman who was murdered by the police just a little over a month ago. We're still trying to understand what happened. Why were there guns involved in the first place? She's not the first. I spent 10 years organizing in Bayview Hunters Point. And the stuff that I saw, with policing in particular, was unbelievable. We don't have time to talk about all the stories. Mm -hmm. And then when we look at even what's happening in this area, right, which is where you see lots of black and brown queer folks, unfortunately, without homes, mm -hmm. where you see black and brown trans folks, unfortunately, without homes. And then you see the development plans for these, this area of San Francisco, and it does not include nearly enough housing. It doesn't include the work that people have been doing here for 30 years, right? Inclusionary zoning, right? Making sure that there's some percentage of housing that can be set aside to make it affordable for people, not just who live here, but people who keep this city going, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and more is coming, more is coming. So we have a lot of work to do, in other words. Uh, a ton. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and who do we need to do it with? I would submit it would be with those who are supposed to be a part of our heart community. In other words, other LGBTQIA people. Do you mm -hmm. see what I'm saying? I do. That in other words, we can't uh, overturn white supremacy and racism without having those who are privileged by it make a decision. That absolutely. That's what needs to occur. So, absolutely. In a real oh, I way. Just, I just wanted to say, um, I'm not from the Bay, but I've read a lot about the changes in San Francisco particularly. In 1970, like you were in the 70s, guess how much, how the percentage of black people in the city, in San Francisco, not Oakland, but San Francisco, it was 40, almost 40%, if not at 40%. Wow. And in 2016, it is less than 3%. If you don't believe me, there's a document on the Human Rights Commission for San Francisco called The Outmigration of Blacks, and it details about both strategic influence from the government as well as economic influences that promoted that um, outmigration of black people from oh, yeah. San Francisco. Indeed, mm -hmm. indeed. What a shame. <laughs> Oh, he's, you're not touching it because you're not from here? <laughs> I'm from Brooklyn. I mean, but the, same can, be said, the, same, the same, same can be said about, I live in Bed-Stuy in Brooklyn, New York, and, and the same issues that you're talking about are the same issues that we are grappling with in Brooklyn, mm -hmm. the same issues that's being grappled with in most urban spaces mm -hmm. um, across the country right now. Right. <laughs> now we're going to audience Q&A. Uh, please ask a question and be brief so that we can get to as many people as possible. What's our first question? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's good to be here. It's good to hear you all speak. It's great. Uh, my name is Darius. Um, the question I have for you is actually kind of on the last point you're speaking of is internalized oppression, right? Mm. Uh, within the community. So I'm originally from Alabama, Birmingham, Alabama. Mm. Been in the Bay for about seven years now. Right. Mm. Uh, Oakland, San Francisco. And the problem I have in the city is that it's difficult to have other men of color, specifically black men of color, if you live in San Francisco, to even acknowledge you exist. Honey. Mm. To even like, 
imagine that you have a shared struggle and a shared history and a shared experience in the world. Uh, because to be perfectly honest, I'm gonna put it as frank as I possibly can, Come on. a lot of the black men that, uh, or men of color in the city are chasing after white men because, and I actually saw on a dating app on the profile, a guy said, oh, if you're not white or less than, then I don't wanna talk to you, right? Yeah. So like we live in this world where this internalized oppression, this internalized hatred exists and it persists. And in this city specifically, how do we deal with that? What are your thoughts on that? <laughs> you see how that happened? <laughs> you see how that went down? You see how it went down like that? <laughs> well. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if it's a problem that's present just in the city. I mean, I often say uh, <laughs> it's so easy for those of us who have been embattled by a thing, mm. um, form various forms of oppression, um, to become experts in practicing that oppression, either on oneself or on others. Um, I'm never interested in politicizing people's dating choices. I am interested in asking folk, for instance, you know, the, the, there's this whole, whole like, no fats, no femmes. <laughs> um, there's this whole idea. I, I know about those dating apps. I'm on them. And I know that there are black men that will say stuff like, I don't want to date other black men. Um, while I'm not interested in politicizing people's dating habits, I am interested in asking the question, well, what type of world or culture or, or how are we socialized to think these ways? Um, so that's a bigger, I mean, that's, that's a conversation that's much, that requires much more nuance. Mm -hmm. What I will say, though, about this notion of internalized um, oppression, one of the things I've been saying to, to black folk, um, you know, not just queer and trans folk, uh, but cisgender folk, our, our allies, is that we, and I say this everywhere I go, any of us have become experts in analyzing whose necks our feet are on. Mm. Well, nope, whose feet are on our necks. Right, so we're all able to articulate the ways that we're embattled by things. Um, you know, uh, homophobia hurts me, sexism hurts me, XX hurts me, but what we aren't really good at analyzing who, is whose next our feet are on. Mm -hmm. That's the work, right? Mm -hmm. So I think the way that we, the thing that we need to be doing is to be really radical is mm -hmm. figuring out the ways that we are all complicit, and this has been said the whole time, in these oppressions that we're talking about now. That's right, that's right. I don't have much to add to that, except um, San Francisco is a particular place. <laughs> it has its own characteristics. So a survival strategy mm. is to build a different kind of community. Yeah. Uh, I agree that it's really a tricky place to get into around yeah. uh, people's relationship choices. Uh, but I, I also do see those dynamics in organizing spaces. Mm. So I could speak on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, I think that there's a lot of work on many sides to do around loving ourselves. Yeah. So even if you choose to date somebody who is not you phenotypically, there is a lot of yeah. work and space needed for us to love ourselves. Yeah. So mm. when we look in our organizing spaces or the spaces where we do our heart work and it's homogenous, mm. we got work to do. Yeah. When we look in our workplaces and it's homogenous, we got things to do. If you can count on both hands how many people of color, how many black people, how many whatever, there's lots of work to do. Yeah. When you start talking about you know somebody who, <laughs> we got work to do. <laughs> Next question, please. So I hope this isn't repetitive because you nailed it at the end there. But um, So I'm a white woman. I'm 32. I live in San Francisco. I'm from South Carolina. That's I so left sad. South Carolina to come to San <laughs> Francisco <not> where <laughs> like everything was going to be equal and everyone's going to get along. And now I've realized that that is not the case. And so I would love <laughs> some insight from you guys. And first, like, thank you so much for today. This has been awesome. But like your thoughts on what somebody like myself who's here in San Francisco, white, straight, but like, goddamn, like, just wants to help and do whatever I can to make a change and be a part of the, the positive, the difference that's inevitably going to happen here at some point. Like, what can I do? What can we do? Mm. 
Yes. <laughs> I want like tangible. I want like tomorrow. What can I do? <laughs> not like big picture. Uh huh. Uh huh. It's also not on your to do list to so, like give me a checklist, but I would love to hear what you would like to see all of us stand up and do. Mm hmm. Um, there's so many things. <laughs> there's a lot of things. So, um, the first thing that I would encourage you to do um, is get to know place. So anytime people want to take action in a spot, mm. it's really important to get yourself a landscape of who's already doing stuff. Yeah? Because yeah, right. sometimes what we can do is we can kind of Christopher Columbus a thing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? Columbus. Where it's like, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> Come up in a spot and you'd be like, there's nothing happening here. <laughs> but oh my, it's so beautiful. I want it all for myself. <laughs> right? So we can we can transform that dynamic. <laughs> there's lots of great that's work right. that's happening here. Uh, I'm just drawn to St. James Infirmary, TJI JP as two really dope like partner organizations that are doing incredible work incredible work. So Danny and Stephanie, raise your hands. See these folk? You can talk to them <laughs> right after this thing is over. Um, second thing, uh, learn how to have conversations with other white, straight folks. Yes. But let's be clear. So let's not do the thing that I think can happen. And, and having organized here for a long time, I've seen this many a time, where it's like, you're so righteous that people ain't hearing you. Right? And this and this. And people are like, right? <laughs> so that's why I say learn how to. Learn how to. Because I say this to white folks a lot. I'd be like, I need, I need y'all to organize each other. Yeah. So, then, so then we could get together and talk about how, how we're about to break this thing down. But, but part of what ends up happening is that um, there's such a righteousness that happens that we don't actually end up moving people. Mm. So... Where is the space mm. to have courageous conversations with other white folks that doesn't devolve into like guilting? Yeah. Right? Which ultimately ends up in inaction, which is what we really don't need, <laughs> right? Or it ends up in like one upping, like I'm doing more than other white folks are doing, so like I get no, <laughs> right? What we want to be doing is creating safe space for folk to ask questions, yeah. to make mistakes. You will make mistakes. I make them all the time, yeah? But also for people to not be so frozen in that, that nothing changes. Mm. So those would be my two pieces of advice. Learn the landscape, don't Christopher Columbus. Three pieces, talk to Danny and Stephanie, <laughs> and learn how to create courageous space for other white folks who are grappling with the same question that you are so that we could actually get down together and do some work. My, I have one. And I'd like to respond. <laughs> I'd like to respond to that question as well. Yeah. Do you have Surge here showing up for racial justice? We have the Catalyst Project, and we also have Surge. I know Catalyst well, because Catalyst has been around for quite some Data time. Bomb. These are anti-racist uh, organizations where white people have enough consciousness that they realize that it is their job to deal with white supremacy, to challenge, Come on. and to uh, destroy white supremacy. Um, Michelle Miao and I were speaking uh, earlier. We just met in person <laughs> this afternoon. And I was saying what I often say to try to under help us to understand why it is the way it is. This nation has never had dismantling white supremacy anywhere on its agenda. Mm -hmm. Having been born into Jim Crow Hello. in 1946, Hello. Um, even though I was in the North, I was still born into Jim Crow, so I saw and lived through and benefited from the transformation of the Civil Rights Revolution. But the Civil Rights Revolution, although it definitely um, touched upon white supremacy and was motivated by the existence of white supremacy, it was about the securing of basic civil rights, Gosh, like the right to vote, the right to public accommodation, mm -hmm. the right to uh, use institutions like hospitals and schools and buses the same way that people who were, uh, you know, uh, people who were white got to do. 
they, they, it was not an intervention to understand and to destroy white supremacy. Right. That has never happened in this nation. And the reason why is because white supremacy is extremely beneficial uh, oh. to those who rule uh, the society, the 1%. Yes. Uh, there would be no 1% <laughs> if it was not for white supremacy and racism. So uh, that's just a little capsule there, but the thing is you need to find people who um, are committed to being co-conspirators, not merely uh, allies. And also, you can check out the, uh, very, uh, the very positive uh, and respected history of white lesbian feminists who did all this stuff already Come on. some decades ago. So, so you, you, have, you have role models. You have role models you can be proud of. You have Adrian Rich, you have Ellie Balkan, yes. you have Dorothy Allison, you have Amber Hollabaugh, who's actually from here. You have these wonderful white women, all of them my friends, <laughs> <laughs> Mab Seagrass, um, who said, you know what? This racism thing, particularly in the women's movement, because that's where a lot of the work happened, isn't, isn't, it isn't working. Next question. Blue. <laughs> And it is, as I, as I have been informed, it is the last question. Next question is the last question. <laughs> she wow, reads. so I better make it good, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let me just first say, dear Father God, God, my tongue and my heart so I can ask this question right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. First of all, we're going to have, there was, this experience has been a come to Jesus moment. Huh. So I really want to just speak some, some serious, because we hit some really important points. First, the 3% you're talking about in San Francisco, I am that 3%. Amen. I live here. And when you talk about the 3%, the gay black experience is even less than that. Come on. So a part of what I want to talk about, I also happen to be one of the board members on the SF Pride this year, led by the leader of uh, Miss Michelle Meow. I'm excited yeah. with her leadership. <laughs> I'm going to send this question in this context. First of all, I was born in New Orleans, and I was a product of what they call forced busing. Mm. White folks didn't know that in the 70s when folks in New Orleans who could not, uh, schools did not want to integrate, they took the black folks in certain parts of New Orleans and they shipped them to the white schools. And all I heard was nigga, 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 nigga. And that's, that's my experience. I never share this to my friends. I also witnessed at the age of seven my brother being hanged from a banister. I've never spoken about this publicly, but I'm going to do it here because it's Black Lives Matter. I moved to San Francisco one day, once I discovered my coordinates. It's somehow racism, almost like if you're driving in a car and they hit you broadside. I never expect this level of racism. I've seen racism in the highest way, but the subtleties that happens here in San Francisco is very different. I'm getting to my question. We just went to this uh, forum of the Orlando, mm -hmm. and I saw all of our speakers in the local talking, and I was waiting patiently. I saw Supervisor Campos, Scott Weiner, outside of Andrea Shorter, I saw not one elected official that represented me, my black experience, my any of that. And to know, for those of you, I was raised from as a uh, little kid from my five sisters in New Orleans with surrogate. Mm -hmm. So my question is this, mm -hmm. besides being marginalized, and I happen to work in the most, how would I say, mm -hmm. predominantly white, affluent, Society, that's Silicon Valley. Those of you who mm -hmm. don't know, I'm a program manager for five, what they call um, America's Job Centers Come in on. Silicon Valley. I yep. manage three of those centers. Yep. Those centers. And I have about 35 employees and who report me, to me. Excuse me, I'm sorry, your question? Okay. <laughs> the question is this. How do we find people mm. for us to help us to run for public office so that we have our own voice so regular people of color in New in San Francisco can be elected and not allow other people to speak for us and put the message in the mainstream. Does anyone have a one minute answer? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I do. Yeah, so there are programs that do that, but I, I, I want to be real clear. So, uh, and I'm gonna keep it 100. 
I used to organize here. I don't live here no more. I don't organize here no more. I'm going to say everything I want to say. <laughs> so um, we have more black elected officials on the Board of Supervisors in San Francisco than has been true in 40 years. But yet, change has not come. Right. Mm -hmm. So what I would <laughs> advise is to first figure out what is my platform? Who am I accountable to? Yeah. And how do we develop public officials and public leaders who actually feel accountable to the communities that are struggling here? So many of the new crop of elected officials that did not come from social movements here in San Francisco are very clear that they're not accountable to us. They're very clear about that. So when one supervisor, right, can make it so that people can't sleep on the streets mm. in the Castro, can uh, make it so that people can't be clothing optional in the Castro, but yet they continue to get donations, yet they continue to mm -hmm. get support, and they're able to walk around like nothing, business as usual. That means, right, that we have to change the way in which we engage in electoral organizing here in San Francisco. And there are a lot of people who did a lot of work to figure that out. And because of all the changes in demographics, like it's impacted our organizing as well. So if y'all are thinking about how to have somebody who's accountable to an agenda that actually shifts conditions in San Francisco, right? then you have to be thinking about what's the ongoing mechanism of accountability and what are you willing to do to make sure that they're not comfortable when they don't do the right thing. Right. It is now an informed tradition to ask all our speakers the following question. What is your 60 second idea to change the world? I would put the emphasis on 60 seconds. <laughs> I'll start with you. That's a good thing. <laughs> 55, 54, okay. Yeah, please. Um, I'm over here trying to time Really quick, I just wanna say again, it's a, been a pleasure to share um, this, mm. this panel with you all. Um, mm. And Barbara, thank you again for your, for your work. <laughs> Mine is to really not only rethink, but to redo our educational um, structure in this country, public education, we teach people how, in a, in a, under neoliberal capitalism, we create laborers, workers. We don't create visionaries. Mm. Um, and if we weren't taught how to go out here to work so that somebody else um, can get rich, but if we gave people the tools to rethink and to think about themselves in the world and how they can be uh, change agents in it, we'll have a better society to be living in. <laughs> I'm just gonna be really cliche, really cliche, and say world peace. <laughs> and lots and lots of food. <laughs> no liquor? Huh? No drinks? <laughs> liquor too. I like white wine. <laughs> Pinot Grigio. <laughs> I'm not sure I can follow that. <laughs> food is everything. <laughs> Uh, my 60-second thing of how to change the world uh, would involve making sure that the people who are carrying the burden of the impacts of these systems every day are front and center in developing the strategies for what a different world can look like. Yes, right. We will find and get change if folk will stop speaking for other people, <laughs> let people speak for themselves, <laughs> take their ideas seriously, and know how to play your position. We could really win some things. So my uh, suggestion is bring the feminism of radical women of color huh. out from the margins hmm. into a position of power and decision making. 
um, and, and dig deep into structural and institutionalized oppression. Why is it the way it is? Not the cosmetics of it or the, you know, the, like the bright shiny object over there of it, but like, why is it the way it is? And then make a lifetime commitment to changing that. Thanks. <laughs> So you're already doing it, but let's give a big round of applause to our panelists. And to San Francisco Pride for their support. And thank you all so much. And to the Commonwealth Club, and thank you all so much for joining us this evening here at N Forum at the Commonwealth Club. Hey. Good evening. Hey.